gives us really great pleasure to, today to, and an honor to introduce the last speaker of our 2020-2021 seminar series, uh, Professor Terry McGannity from the University of Essex. Um, and just to give you a quick uh, synopsis, so Terry's been a professor there uh, since 2019, but he's, he's been at Essex for most of his career, I think it's fair to say, since 1999. Before that, he did a couple of postdocs, one at Reading and then one at Jamstack, which must have been really fun, especially for this kind of stuff that you're talking about today. Um, so uh, he did his PhD in, in ancient salt deposits and, and the microbes that live in, in those at Leicester. Um, and in the, in the last, and his work is, has focused a lot on, on halophiles, obviously, as we all know him very well for his work in that field, but he's also done um, a lot of work more broadly speaking in biogeochemical cycling and microbial ecology. Um, he had the, 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 um, the, the good uh, fortune of planning his most recent research sabbatical in 2019, 2020. I'm sure that timing has just been perfect for you, Terry, with regards to getting more research done this past year, a couple of years, but I hope that somehow you've managed to salvage <laughs> some productivity out of, out of this, this past uh, season in hell for most of us research-wise and field-work-wise. Um, so I, I won't spend much more uh, uh, time just introducing him. I think a lot of you guys already know him for his work and we're really excited to have him here today. And also, I, I want to get out of your way, Terry, because you mentioned that you, you wanted to say a couple things at the beginning and leave you time for that, and then leave, you, leave us some time for questions for you at the end of uh, the, your talk today. But if I could just drop one last thing in here, I am going to uh, put a link in the chat, which I will do right now, for a survey. Um, that we're going to ask our audience members today, and we'll publish this as well on the Geomicrobiology Network uh, website. Um, if we could ask you guys to respond to the survey when you get a chance, uh, just giving us some feedback on, on how the seminar series has gone this year. It's a short survey, five questions, and, um, and we'd really appreciate it. And then as a last note, we are recording today, so just um, feel free to uh, keep your, your microphones and cameras off. Um, and obviously, if, we could, if you could keep your microphones off for background noise, and then we're happy to entertain questions at the end, either live or via the chat. Okay, so I think that's it. Karen, did I miss anything? I think that was perfect, John. Think we're good for now? Okay, all right, so I'll get out of the way. Sorry. All right, over to you, Terry. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, John, for that introduction, and thanks for asking me to, to come along today. Um, and uh, my answer to the uh, five survey questions will be excellent, 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 and excellent. Thank you, uh, Karen and, and Kevin and, and colleagues for doing such a fantastic job. It really is um, a great resource. So um, if I may just make a, a small plug for three conferences. Um, I hope they don't clash with any of yours, um, but maybe of interest to Geomicrobiology Network folk. The first one is a little bit niche. Um, it, it's uh, on uh, evaporite uh, deposits in Salzburg. Uh, and I, I say this more in, in hope than expectation, perhaps. Um, second one is one that I think many of us know. It's called MMEG, my Molecular Microbial Ecology Group meeting uh, based in Norwich, um, 1st, 2nd of December. Hopefully, it will happen this year. And finally, one that I'm organizing, it's a Microbiology Society focus me meeting, again, based in Norwich. Uh, it's with Marcella and Anderson um, uh, and Colin Murrell. And it's about one of my other big interests and that's microbial cycling of volatile organic compounds, biogeochemistry to biotechnology. So um, those, that information's uh, available, uh, on, will be available on the, on the video recording and the website should be available soon. So thank you for allowing me to plug those. I will now move on to the matter in hand and that's to look at the limits to microbial life using as a specific example, uh, slow, salty, subterranean survival. Slow, sometimes a bit more of a boom bust existence rather than continuously slow. Um, after giving you a little bit of background, um, I'll ask four questions and they get increasingly more difficult. You know, the first ones are more who type questions. The last one is a how 
type question, which is always uh, much more tricky. So we'll ask, are microbes inside halite crystals the same as those outside? We'll ask, what can life in a pinch of salt tell us about biogeo bi uh, biogeo biogeography? Uh, that's a little bit tangential, but it does feed into question three, uh, which is a you know, key part of the talk, and that's, are some microbes better than others at surviving in salt? And then finally, the how question, how can microbes survive over geological focusing on uh, extreme halophiles. Okay, so those of us who live in uh, the temperate zones of the world uh, might think that um, hypersaline environments are rather rare, okay? But we only have to look under our feet in, in many parts of the UK to know that there's vast uh, salt deposits, there are small scale salt deposits that form and disappear, they're very ephemeral. and one of my favorite places is, is the Mediterranean, where we have vast uh, salt deposits that formed 5.96 million years ago as the Mediterranean started to dry up. And, and this is the subject of, of some of our work. Um, and, and sometimes the, those, those old hypersaline rocks come into contact with uh, water. For example, the deep hypersaline anoxic basins, which um, uh, several people on the call here have, have investigated, including myself. And just to point out that actually salt moves. Okay? So I, I love this picture. These are salt glaciers uh, in the Zagros Mountains in Iran. And it's actually what you're looking at, are these black tongue-shaped uh, um, salt deposits. This is salt oozing out of the mountain. And yeah, they are in, in more uh, tropical uh, regions of the world. You know, vast, there are vast deposits of, of salts like the Makarikari salt pans in Botswana. Um, this is a, a satellite view. This is roughly the size of the island of Jamaica. There's the Okavanga Delta or scale. So these are not trivial uh, environments in terms of, of quantity. Um, and of course, as we've seen from the wonderful talk by uh, Mark Fox Powell, um, there's hyperstabilized worlds uh, elsewhere in the solar system. Okay, and just a little bit about uh, the organisms that inhabit these types of environments. Now, what I'm going to focus on here are the brines, and I'm going to focus on the oxid brines, because, you know, if we look at anoxic environments, things are very different. But I'm going to focus on kind of salt and salina type um, communities. And these brines uh, would have are and would have been in the past dominated by archaea with some bacteria and a select few eukarya. This is an image of, of uh, San Francisco Bay Sultans and each different colored pond is a different color because it's a different salinity dominated by a different community. And the most salty ones are the very red ones uh, that are primarily dominated by halo archaea, but also some other organisms. And this very schematic uh, picture tells us what happens when you go from seawater to saturated NaCl using, as an example, these uh, salinas. Okay, they're very good for understanding this type of succession. Most bacteria decrease to nothingness in terms of abundance and diversity. There's a, a few exceptions, one of which is one I'll talk about today, a bacterium called Selenibacteruba, which is in some respects an arcane in disguise. It's borrowed, stolen a lot of genes from uh, halo archaea, so it seems. There are some eukarya, uh, especially the chlorophyte Donaliella selena. Um, obviously it's a, it's a phototroph um, and it suffers as NACL reaches saturation, but preceding that at high salt concentrations, it does particularly well. And then most halo archaea do exceptionally well in saturated uh, NACL. And of course, there's the nano halo archaea and there's other groups as well. So that's just a very schematic pitch. And just to introduce you to a few of the organisms that I'm going to talk about today. And this image just shows another organism that I want to mention today, and that's Halo quadratum, um, the square flat uh, uh, 
cell that's very common in these uh, salt saturated uh, salinas. Uh, the little white dots are uh, gas vesicles, flotation devices that allow it to uh, move up and down. Um, again, some quite basic information, but just, just to give you a broader picture, um, there are two main adaptations to living in hypersaline environments. Um, if you had E. coli, of course, um, water would gush out of the cell uh, by osmosis. Uh, this would lead to compromised macromolecules and all sorts of effects that would lead to ultimately to cell death. Organisms like Haloarchaea um, and Selenibacter are extreme obligate halophiles. They adopt the salt in the cell strategy, importing potassium and chloride into the cell to an equivalent concentration to the salt outside the cell. So their intracellular enzymes are committed uh, to living under those conditions, they're obligate halophiles. And then you have the moderate halophiles um, that synthesize or import organic compatible solutes as osmolites, uh, things like exoene, glycine betaine, or in the case of Donaliella, Selena, the, the, the chlorophyte, chlorophyte shown here, uh, an awful lot of the osmolite. Uh, of course, it's not as clear cut as that. There's organisms that adopt those strategies and intermediate strategies and so on, but that's a, a general uh, picture. Um, I show you this purely because I, I like it. It's a, a nice representation of the image I, I showed you previously. And uh, if you want to watch some nice videos of uh, uh, halophilic life, uh, the MedSalt um, webpage uh, has several of the MedSalt is, is a cost action, uh, an EU cost action that we are involved in. But it also serves to remind me to tell you that these environments are oxygen poor. There is oxygen in there, but it's very low availability um, because oxygen doesn't dissolve in hypersaline brines very well. And generally they're also high temperature, which restricts oxygen solubility. And just to look a little bit at what happens as we reach halide precipitation, and what happens is halo care tend to become trapped inside the growing halo crystals. This is an agar plate, and this colony of Halobacterium salinarum NRC1, an organism I'll talk a lot about, is growing luxuriantly on the surface despite being covered with uh, salt crystals, halide crystals, as the plate dries out, a perennial problem of growing these bugs. Uh, I've grow, grown these bugs, but not really a problem for this particular bug. And this lovely picture from Sabine Castanier is uh, a cuboid halite crystal forming from a sultan around cells. So they get trapped inside the crystal and indeed they can help the precipitation of those crystals. Um, it's just a little experiment done by um, Nora Georgieva and Maria Mariulo. Uh, and this represents um, a brine, nearly salt saturated, with no added microbes. And these have added microbes. Um, you can't see a big effect with these four, uh, but with Halobacterium norisensei, you can see multiple crystals forming at day one that are not forming in the control, suggesting that Halobacterium norisense has some feature that allows the enhanced precipitation of halite. That mechanism is currently unknown. Um, and it also leads to larger crystals. This shows uh, massive crystals in different size fractions. So if I take you over to the control, you'll note that there's no greater than nine millimeter fraction, whereas there are in each of the other treatments where we have different Halobacterium, Selenibacter, and Donaliella. So they affect the size of the crystals. They increase the size of the crystals, and some of them uh, enhance uh, the precipitation of halite. And where do they go? And it's been known for a long time now from the great work of Bill Grant uh, that they live inside the brine inclusions in halite. So it's important to remember that halite in most cases, isn't absolutely solid. In fact, it can be up to 5% liquid. And that liquid, of course, is a saturated uh, brine. And 
the top left image shows a freeze etched SEM image um, of uh, Halo Archaea, can't remember which organism it was, um, forming a biofilm within um, a salt crystal. These are lab made crystals. All of these are lab made crystals where you, you, you mix uh, the culture with um, sodium chloride and allow it to precipitate out. Um, here we can see the fluid inclusions lit up by the fluorescently stained uh, halo archaea. Um, shows precisely where they go. And this is an image from our lab where we co entombed halo archaea with Donaliella. And this is a single fluid inclusion. And you can see the Donali other cells, the blue is DNA and the red are the chloroplasts, but also you can see hundreds, if not thousands perhaps, of uh, small blue dots which represent the halo bacteria. So it's clear where uh, they're going in the halo. Why do they do this? Um, well, probably it, it's a strategy to avoid desiccation. Um, but also, it's not completely dry once you precipitate halite. So what I should say is that seawater precipitates different minerals in a specific order, carbonate, gypsum, calcium sulfate, and halite. Um, but salts, ions like the magnesium in the original seawater haven't precipitated yet, so they get left behind. They're more soluble. And actually, um, that magnesium-rich brine that's left behind is keotropic. Um, rather busy slide, but it's really just to show you that what I mean by paratropic is that magnesium chloride destabilizes biological macromolecules. It does so in a non-linear way. In this case, using an example of agar as a biological macromolecule, it depresses the gel melting point in contrast to sodium chloride, which stabilizes. And this is a whole big story in itself. And I notice uh, Peter uh, on the call, he's a co-author on, on, on this paper and this, this uh, much bigger separate story. Okay, so back to the issue in hand and running through some of the questions. Question one, are microbes inside the halide the same as those outside? This is work that um, Tom Hubie did as part of a master's project. We got to go to Trapani in uh, Sicily uh, on the back of a, a, a cost action, med school cost action meeting. This is what the sultans look like when they're in the prime. Um, I should have said that the red pigmentation is due to the carotenoids of the halo archaea, but also perhaps a contribution to Donaliella salina, although there wasn't much Donaliella in these ponds when we uh, sample them. Um, yeah, and, and these are very dense, um, uh, uh, turbid uh, solutions They're like broths. Uh, primarily of halo archaea. So we, we measured this by qPCR and archaeal genes were 530 fold more abundant than bacterial genes. And of the archaea, greater than 95% were halo archaea. Okay, and there's a lot of diversity within the halo archaea as you'll see, but that justifies our decision focus on uh, studying the halo archaea in these environments. And we looked at three different ponds uh, shown here aerially uh, and in uh, sort of side view. Um, and each of these had a slightly different uh, composition. Take home message is that pond one, uh, where you've got the collection of the salt here, had the lowest water activity, it was the most salty. And pond two was the least salty, and pond three was intermediate, but they were all verging on saturation, okay, or saturated. Uh, with sodium chloride. And what we did in pond one, we did some in situ analysis where we took brine, we took uh, salt uh, crystals and, 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 um, and uh, characterized the community within. And in all of them, we took brines back to the lab and we made, um, we, we carried out an experiment basically where we poured them in petri dishes, allowed the halide to precipitate and had control brines. Uh, side by side, uh, they were not allowed to precipitate, and we analyzed the brines and the crystals at different times, looking at um, the archaeal, and we also did the bacterial community. I'll just talk about the archaeal. Okay, so in brine, in pond one, looking at the in situ community, uh, just a, a very quick take home message is that they are largely the same 
what you do see is this reduced relative abundance of halo quadratum within the halite uh, crystals. Doesn't fully address the question that we set out to address because this halite may have formed from a brine that was present a few days beforehand, which may have had a different community composition. Okay, I'll just point that out. Um, but what we did is focus on the experiment that we did, looking at what grew, uh, sorry, what survived within the brines and, and the halite, and how that changed over time. And this is an N NMDS plot, uh, where each point represents a particular community, and if they're closer together, they're more similar. Uh, the different colors represent different ponds. The different symbols represent different time points. Uh, and these are the same data, uh, analyzed the same, but just kind of drawn out, <coughs> excuse me, from each other uh, for real illustration. And you can see that over time, the brine communities diversify a bit more, but actually the halide communities do not. Uh, there's basically no significant change in communities over time. Um, but the brine origin does influence the community composition. Okay, just show this another way and indicate some key microbes uh, that we, we, we found. So here's the uh, time and weeks of entombment in three different ponds and the relative abundance of different uh, genera. Uh, you can basically see that there's, there's hardly any change. Uh, perhaps a reduction here in nanoselina, which is not a haloarchaean, part of the DPAN uh, group. And, and, and we have other evidence that that doesn't like uh, living within soil crystals, or at least a subset of them don't. Okay, so the take home message here and answer to question one is halo arche are approximately uniformly entombed and survive equally inside halite over 21 weeks. So this is just 21 weeks. You know, we're not looking at geological time here, but we got a rather strange result. Okay, and that was that in the brines, the control brines, if you like, we saw an increase in halobacterium and halo lamina. It's not really registered greatly because they started at such a low base level, but halobacterium increased 100 fold and halo lamina tenfold. And I'll come back to these two genera in just a moment. Okay, let's look at what salt can tell us about microbial uh, biogeography. And this is work that was uh, done by a group of, of, of French colleagues, SALT's collected by Laurent Dufosse, and uh, the analysis done uh, by Dave Clark. And this was collecting um, halite from sultans from across the world. Laurent had that um, tough job um, from the Indian Ocean, across the Atlantic, and within the Mediterranean. So three uh, by geographic regions, and all of the salts were approximately four years old. Okay, so an order of magnitude older than uh, the 21 weeks that we looked at in the previous experiment. Um, and we analyzed the RPL communities, and just in a nutshell, what we found was, um, okay, so what, what this is showing, each color stroke number uh, represents a similar community type. So what we're seeing are similar communities like Community 7 present in both the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, uh, and Community number 2 present in, in both. And, and, and what, overall what we found was a weak distance decay relationship, i.e. distance sultans have similar communities. And we think this relates to um, how microbes uh, are shifted from place to place perhaps by winds, most probably by birds, perhaps by some human activity, given that these are working uh, sultans. Maybe also a little bit by, by, by seawater for some uh, types, uh, but most halo archaea uh, will lie in seawater, and these are effectively island communities. Okay, so that's, that's that story, but the reason why I'm telling you this, because it, it shows something else, um, and, and that is that the main um, operational taxonomic units uh, belonged to three different species. These were present in all of the samples and, and the highest abundance. Halo lamina, Halobacterium norisense, a name that I'll come back to, I've already mentioned it, but I'll come back to it, and Halo rubrum orientale. Okay, so they 
seem to be good at surviving. So we're feeding into question three here. Ela Quadrat and Walls BI, uh, less so, um, despite its uh, much higher abundance in brines, doesn't seem to be that abundant in halide, but it's actually very, very variable. And whereas the community has been always changed much between regions, some um, individual OTUs did, uh, like those belonging to Halicot Bottom. So that's a, a kind of other story, but, but our general consensus is that Halicot Bottom doesn't generally survive very well inside halides, and I'll show you some evidence for that here. Okay, so moving on to question are some microbes better than others at surviving in soil? So we've had the kind of field experiments, the field stroke lab experiments. These are purely lab experiments that I'm going to tell you about now. And this work was done by a PhD student a few years ago. This is Audrey Gamain, uh, shown here. Um, and again, we grew halophilic microbes in the lab, collected, washed and resuspended the cells, allowed the halide to precipitate, and then periodically checked for growth. And I'm just gonna run through a few of these uh, slides just, just, just to indicate what we found. The key message was what we found for Halobacterium norosense. Uh, what we have here um, on the y-axis is incubation time for recovery, either lag phase. So periodically we would take the crystals that have been left, um, and pop them into um, uh, high salt broth uh, to, to, that we know that these organisms grow in and measure the time until it became turbid. Okay, so it's effectively what you're looking at here is lag phase. So the lower the number, the, the more healthy, viable, greater number of, of cells there are. Um, and what this tells us, if we look at the, the cells only without added nutrients, uh, Halobacterium norosense has no apparent loss of viability over the 27 months of this experiment, which is quite remarkable. Even Halobacterium salinorum, the kind of workhorse uh, in, in, in the Haloarchaea world, or one of the two, um, um, showed good survival. Okay, Still a, a decrease in, uh, uh, or sorry, an increase in lag phase, therefore some loss of viability but still surviving pretty well over the period of the experiment. And actually, uh, Maria Magliolo has done a, a separate experiment with Halobacterium selenorum in these kind of simulated fluid inclusions, if you like, in, in sealed, uh, hermetically sealed bottles. Uh, and she's halfway through this. And after 140 days, what she's done differently is measured. Uh, she's done viable counts, colony forming units, Per mill. And there is a drop off, as in the previous experiment, uh, quite a notable drop off at first, two orders of magnitude, but then it seems to be leveling off. So I'm really curious to see how this uh, pattern progresses over the next half year and longer. Okay, just a, a couple of other organisms, two that I've mentioned already. The first one is Selene Pacaruba. Note the different scale here. This goes up to 50 days. Um, and Selene bacteria, we couldn't recover after 17 weeks. Okay, so it does not survive well in uh, brine inclusions in the lab. And this tallies with the fact that we've never seen it in ancient halite. Okay. Um, Helicodratum wolsbii, the square shaped cell. Um, doesn't do very well. Um, it does survive in halite, uh, but um, it, it, it's, um, there's a general drop in viability over time. But of course, in nature, these organisms aren't alone. They're living with other organisms. So we combine these two to see what effect uh, they would have. And we had reason for doing that because they have been shown to work well together. I'll explain in a moment. And it does indeed, when they're together, improve the viability and improves the viability of both of them. We can see both the square and the Cellini back there when we, when we count them uh, at the end. And we think that is because, or one reason why this may be, uh, is due to metab uh, metabolite sharing. Okay, so this is an agar plate with a, a kind of pinprick colony of Halo quadratum uh, shown here. 
Um, and here's a colony of Selene bacta. And when Helicodratum grows next to Selene bacta, it suddenly becomes huge, relatively huge. And based on other studies, we think what may be happening is that the Selene bacta uh, is feeding uh, off something, perhaps glycerol. Uh, it can utilize glycerol to produce dihydroxyacetone. Uh, and this can be used in turn by helicodratum. And David and Lauren has shown that this is, this is a, you know, a likely uh, scenario. But there may be a lot of other things going on too. This is, I just like this picture because it shows how flat helicodratum is. Probably a gas vesicle there. And how it's surrounded by, um, in this case, it's a halomucin, a protein um, sheath. And it has cells associated with it in the natural environment. Always important to remember that when we're doing these kind of experiments. Okay, so obviously we'd like to uh, do these experiments forever. Uh, we can't really do that. Uh, PhD lifetime is generally three years. Um, who knows how long my lifetime might be, um, but it's certainly not uh, geological in scale. So we need to get uh, all salts. And um, as I kind of pointed out earlier, salt comes up to the surface in many uh, different geysers, um, hypersaline and oxid brines, salt glaciers, um, groundwater flow, mining, solution mining. But of course, none of these is a very good sample if we want to study what's inside the salt because they've been mixed with um, microbes on the surface. So we could go down um, the mine, which we've done uh, on several uh, occasions, or we could get core material. And that's where I'm gonna focus on today. We obtained a 25 meter core of halite uh, from beneath the Salagrande in Chile. And this was from Guillermo John Diaz, a co-author on this paper uh, of Audrey's. Um, here on the right, we're looking south. Okay, and this just shows the location of the Sala Grande. It's um, uh, an intermontane basin, incredibly dry, hydrologically inactive, um, at least since 1.3 million years ago. And this just shows the cores and, and how I've represented them. The focus we, we studied from the surface, okay, right through to uh, 15 meters. Uh, the surface frosts are nothing to do with uh, what's happening or what, you know, a, a ancient halite, if you like, because these have been redissolved uh, due to uh, fogs and occasional precipitation. But beyond two meters, there's absolutely no evidence. Uh, that water's had an, any influence since deposition. Okay, and as part of this, so, so, so we took um, uh, the, the, the halide samples, we uh, chipped to allow crystals from inside the center to fall out and transferred those into our surface sterilization procedure, which involves lots of um, bleach, um, uh, alkali acid, etc., uh, which had been tested um, on, on internally inoculated and externally inoculated uh, crystals, uh, and which proved to work exceptionally well. Okay, so this is our go-to surface sterilization procedure. That's one of the nice things about halite. Yes, you can get cracks, but if you look at the crystals, you can have a, an enclosed system that you can really um, sterilize uh, the surface of. Okay, so after that careful work, uh, Audrey um, uh, did the DNA extraction, PCRs, lots of process negative controls included. And the upshot is she got uh, PCR products, lots from the surface, as you'd expect, uh, and occasionally from death. And um, just to summarize what she found, so the blue shows where she got direct PCR product. Ah, one thing I should have mentioned is that we also enriched uh, in different media, and the red shows where she got positive enrichments. And the surface samples gave a whole suite of different uh, halo archaea. Um, I'm going to focus really 
on what she found in the deeper samples like 15F and 15L shown on the right, 15 meters. And from the PCR, she detected Halobacterium salinorum like organisms. Um, PCR doesn't tell you anything about viability. I recognize that, of course, that's important uh, to mention. But to point out that this uh, species or close relatives of this species have been found in ancient salt before, including 97,000 year old halite by Melanie Mormile and others. And, and having reproducibility is always important in these types of experiments. Um, and in red from the, um, from the five meter uh, enrichments, she found strains that were similar to Halobacterium norisensei, uh, uh, an organism that, that keeps recurring uh, in this presentation, and that we'll talk about more here. Okay, so as I said, repeatability is important, um, and Halobacterium norisensei and relatives, there's other species like Hubeense and Salonarum that have been found as well, have been isolated, indicated with an I, or detected uh, by PCR, shown with a D, in various ancient halites of different ages, as shown here, with our Chile sample uh, shown at the top. Now, um, this reproducibility is always good. You have to be careful, though. You have to look and see what methods were used. So some of them, some of the older samples were perhaps from uh, environments that um, were, were contamination from the surface could have occurred. Maybe the surface sterilization technique wasn't as rigorous, but there's no question, irrespective of that, that there are reproducible finds of Halobacterium norisense uh, and relatives in ancient salt. Um, and of course, it's right to ask, are they laboratory contamination? I, from what we've done, I'm uh, as, as sure as I can be that that's not the case based on the controls that we've incorporated and based on uh, the tests that we've done, swabbing benches, swabbing door handles, and then putting them into high salt media that we also grow uh, Norisense on. Uh, if something grows, it's generally a Staphylococcus, and we've not isolated Halobacterium norisense in that way. So it doesn't seem to be floating around uh, the lab. Uh, it could be recent contamination from the environment. And that's where our collaborations with geologists are hugely important, who know about the depositional environment, uh, the likelihood of uh, uh, incursion. They can look at halides and, and see whether the, the, they've, it's got primary fluid inclusions. And I should say that the, the um, uh, the Chilean samples all had primary fluid inclusions. Okay, so if you remove uh, that as a possibility, then we have to accept that Halo Archaea, and especially this group, uh, the Halobacterium species, uh, are likely to be as old as the salt. I'm always very cautious about this because I still think there's a lot of work to be done uh, on this. Okay, so you also have to tackle this from another angle. And that's to uh, understand how microbes could survive over geological time. And this has been done with different types of microbes and deep sea sediments. Uh, I'm gonna focus obviously on the halo archaea. And you also have to ask, well, what can kill microbes? And you know, in this situation, there's no grazers. Um, we can exclude from our sampling extreme temperature, et cetera. Other factors could come into play, but the most likely killers are various stresses, including radiation. And by this, I don't mean one single dose of radiation. I mean accumulated radiation over time and the damage that that can do uh, to biological macromolecules. Okay? And it's really reactive oxygen species uh, that are, are produced um, that, that Halo Archaea especially have to be able to cope with in order to survive over a long time. Okay, so what are the features of living in halite that support long-term survival? Well, effectively, this is a halite crystal again with Halo Archaea inside, the orange color. Um, effectively, they're little nuclear bunkers. They can protect from radiation. 
And this uh, has been shown by others. So Fendrihan and colleagues showed that entombed cells needed a hundredfold high dose of UV radiation to cause the same damage as, as cells seen in liquid culture. Um, this is some work from uh, Maria Magliolo with colleagues at the DLR in uh, Cologne, Germany. Uh, and and uh, they found, um, here we have again, the lag phase after treatment and different treatments with the control, no radiation control here. And these are replicates, there's just, just no, there was no variation um, um, within the measurements. But UV, polychromatic UV doses uh, of, the, uh, of this much and, 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 and UVC um, had zero effect on the entombed halobacterium selenarum. Ionizing radiation at 5,000 gray had some effect, okay? It, it increased at the time required for regrowth. Uh, and Maria's in the process of establishing new experiments to investigate this further. But just to put this in context, 0.5 grays would um, lead to radiation, radiation sickness in humans and, and, and lead to death in many cases. So these, uh, the halite protects against radiation, but they are inherently radiation tolerant species, as we'll see in just a moment. Okay, there's the fluid inclusions, the brine inclusions themselves are, are, are beneficial, uh, the salt saturated, low oxygen concentration, therefore less likelihood of uh, reactive oxygen species formation. But importantly, you get coentumment. Think back to how dense those um, sultans were, how turbid they were, how many cells were packed into a fluid inclusion. Um, also, you can look at old fluid inclusions like this one. This is nice work from Tim Lowenstein's lab uh, from Death Valley, 34,000 year old halite. And you can see cells, and these are undoubtedly at the Salina, and smaller cells, most probably halo archaea, because halo archaea have been isolated from these environments by Tim Lowenstein and co. So they come with a packed lunch. And of course, in order to survive, as James Bradley uh, expertly explained in his uh, Geomicrobiology Network presentation, which I thoroughly recommend uh, uh, you watching if you haven't already, microbes need enough power, or energy to just take over, okay, to repair damaged macromolecules, to maintain um, a, a, a chemiosmotic gradient and so on. And we've done some calculations, um, and there's all sorts of provisors with these calculations, but based on Price and Sauer's idea that, you know, for a cell to survive 100 million years, it would need 50,000 times its own mass. Then if you calculate a typical um, fluid inclusion size, uh, it would have 50,000 cells. So in a fluid inclusion of this size, then potentially there's the uh, opportunity by feeding on necromass to survive for, you know, 50, uh, for, for 100 uh, million years. Other ways of doing it is to look at what one Donaliella cell could provide. And Oren uh, suggests that this is enough energy uh, for a single miniaturized cell uh, to survive for 12 million years. So you know, these, uh, I, I, I agree, there's lots of provisos here, but, but they give an idea for the potential to survive uh, over long term. And now let's look at the organisms themselves, specifically Halobacterium. And here I talk collectively about Halobacterium, most of the studies on, on, on NRC1. Um, but remember that Norosense is the best survivor and we really need more studies on that organism. Um, it takes a lot less energy to protect against damage from accumulated radiation, for example, than it does to repair damage. And this is the major investment that we see in halo archaea in much the same way that we see in Deinococcus radiogeurans. Um, they have innately high potassium, high halide concentrations, which have been shown to protect against reactive oxygen species, high manganese iron ratios, iron uh, um, uh, reacts to, to uh, like Fenton uh, reaction to create more reactive oxygen species. Uh, so reduction in iron, the formation of manganese antioxidant complexes as in Deinococcus, 
Also, they have lots of carotenoids, the red color, and menaquinones with the um, conjugated double bonds that again can mop up reactive oxygen species. DNA with high GC content may be important, and they have the usual suite of um, peroxidases, etc. The ROS protecting enzymes. And then in terms of metabolism, uh, they seem to fare well. I'll talk about anaerobic metabolism in just a moment. Um, and, and their ability to use diverse carbon energy sources, storage compounds, they miniaturize. Okay, so they can reduce the amount of ATP. And this so miniaturization has been shown to be good on the conditions of energy limitation. And being archaea, they have archaea, which means that their membranes are tightly packed and which leads to less leakage and thus loss of energy. Um, they also have a, a, the suite of, of, of uh, repair mechanisms, but they do go by the motto, protect the proteome uh, to, to save, save the genome, but they can repair the genome. And importantly, they're polyploid, sometimes 20 copies of the genome uh, or, or, or more. Um, thus, if there is damage to some DNA, there's the opportunity to repair by homologous recombination against a faithful, uh, to faithfully repair against another copy. It could be that that DNA also serves as a storage compound uh, as well. Uh, I'll just give you finally a little proteomic window into how halo archaea survive in salt, doing similar sorts of experiments, uh, looking at proteome before entombments and 42 days after. Yes, there are differentially uh, produced uh, proteins as shown here. Um, I'll give you the, the take home message. Um, and that is if you look at uh, transcriptional proteins, I mean, polymerase subunits, for example, they decrease uh, in abundance. Monosomal uh, proteins, an indicator of translation, of course, uh, decrease collectively uh, fourfold. Uh, between the two treatments. And you see an increase, a small increase in arginine fermentation and potentially also in dimethyl sulfide, uh, sulfoxide reductase. And, and these organisms can use DMSO as a terminal electron acceptor and they can ferment uh, arginine. So in summary, activity seems to go down, anaerobic energy generation is starting to go up because of course, oxygen cannot penetrate here and there's a lot of biomass and the oxygen will quickly get depleted. Okay, so quickly running through the answers to these questions. Microbes inside halite are largely the same as those outside. Basically everything gets entombed. Um, halo archaea and salt are similar across the globe but there are some uh, individual species exceptions. There are definitely some microbes better at surviving than others. We've seen that with halo lamina that I've not talked about, the halobacterium species. And how they do it is something that uh, we're investigating in detail now and is, is, is the big question. Big thank you to all these people, to Audrey, Dave, uh, Tom, uh, Maria, Nora, and Ameshe, who I haven't mentioned her work. She's working on a halo file pro uh, project, um, basically doing laboratory evolution to try and uh, evolve them uh, to grow a higher salt or lower salt, uh, amongst other things. And thanks to all these people listed here, and especially thank you uh, to you. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Terry. It was a fascinating talk, and I'm sure we've got lots of questions. I know I've got some, but uh, before we move on to that, if I could, sorry, just apologies, just slip in one more acknowledgement that I, someone I forgot to acknowledge in the beginning. I just wanted to briefly give a shout out to Laura Kelly as well at Manchester Metropolitan, who helped us in the early days with promoting uh, and, and supporting this seminar series. So thank you as well, Laura. Okay, so questions for Terry, please. Um, anyone who wants to start us off, either uh, live or in the chat. Checking the chat window here. Okay. Okay, so um, 
Charles uh, Cockell at, at uh, Edinburgh is asked, do you see spores in any of the samples or are they exclusively vegetative cells? And, and how does spore survival um, sit in the fluid inclusion story? Yeah, very good question, Charles. So um, halo archaea do not form spores. Um, and I, I think there's been a lot of work now to show that there are many forms of vegetative cells uh, maybe approaching uh, spores, for, uh, and the, you know, there's like a spectrum from purely vegetative, rapidly grown cells through to, through to spore, um, and many of those can, can, can survive as well as, as spores. Now, where do spores fit into this story? Um, one of the um, earliest um, reports from Ross Veland um, reported a bacillus, a virgie bacillus, species from ancient halides. And this, this is one of the stories that was picked up uh, majorly, um, sometimes criticized, and there was a lot of toing and froing. Um, we have not um, found any sporulating microbes in any of our studies, sort of, actually of any um, time frame. Doesn't mean they're not there. Does, does, uh, I, I just suspect that the, the outnumbered, outcompeted in uh, the environment where the entombment takes place. We have a question from James. Hey Terry, thanks. That was a great talk. Um, super interesting. Of course, I'm going to ask about this long-term survival. <laughs> um, so it seems to me like the way to survive for a really long time is to not grow, or to at least like reduce your metabolism and just get by on maintenance so if these if, as as you suggested if these microbes are trapped initially with abundant energy sources enough to last them for um millions of years at least at kind of minimal minimal energy utilization levels do you have any thoughts on you know what might be impeding their activity or or slowing them down are they doing anything deliberate at least initially when they're entombed with all of this energy to regulate their growth or activity uh, or prevent them from dividing? Um, I have no evidence and I see no evidence yet for that. Hopefully, um, so, so I, I'll just take a step back and, and the, the, I should have said that the, the proteome experiment we, that we did, um, there were some issues, the spectral counts were low. Um, so I just gave some, some initial headline uh, uh, Points and, and what we're doing is repeating that. And we're actually repeating it in uh, the kind of simulated um, fluid inclusions, the, 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 the bottles, sealed bottles, if you like, um, which allows us to get more biomass and, and more reproducibility, I guess, across replicates as well. Um, and hopefully from that, um, we, we, we should get a, a deeper window into, into what's going uh, on in the cell. Um, so yeah, there's, there's no obvious mechanisms yet. Um, there's, there's, there's visible signs of what they're doing. Um, again, we, we, we're just looking into this, but others have, have, have certainly shown that the miniaturization uh, of cells, which is an indication, and that can happen actually quite quickly, um, which is clearly, well, I say clearly, it's not clearly, it is uh, a potential indication that they're slowing things down um, we have this idea that they could be recycling arginine. There's a lot going on in the TCA cycle um, and, and also preventing its overuse, uh, for example, by incorporation into proteins because there's a, a reduction in the arginine tRNA ligase, not a reduction in a lot of the others. You know, these are just ideas at the moment as, as to how it could uh, be conserving what it needs in order to uh, hunker down and, 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 and grow more slowly. Does that answer your question? Or have you any other uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, James. Terry, I was just wondering um, if you know of any sort of, I, I realize maybe organic geochemistry or biomolecule degradation may not be you, the focus. Uh, I mean, it wasn't the focus of your talk Per se, but I wondered if you know these these great salterns that you showed from the aerial photographs. Do we have like evidence for 
the existence of these things into the deep geological past? Um, mm -hmm. And more, more importantly, I guess, do we, do, you have, do we have evidence for particular types of halophiles that have been, or that presumably degraded in these environments, maybe from their biomolecular degradation products? I don't know if, there's, if you can resolve anything more than archaeals, but I just wondered if you might know something about that. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a very uh, good question, and, and it, yes, there's there's um, certainly some work that has been done. For example, on um, uh, the Dead Sea, the former Dead Sea was Lake Lisan, and and the uh, halite there, particularly looking at, as you say, Archaeol and and the C20, C25, uh, and C25, C25 uh, equivalents. Um, and, and some ideas that they, they may serve as a food source uh, um, for, for various organisms. And, and I think that the issue is, whereas, whereas with you know, one, one cell or a few cells, you can, you can regrow them, not in any great, you, know, you, you need lots and lots of samples. So, so the numbers are not gonna be great. Mm -hmm. uh, bit of DNA, you can amplify it, but for lipids, you, you need to extract it and you need enough material. So people are doing this. I mean, most of the evaporite um, lipid analysis has been done in association with gypsum and, and carbonates, but there is work also um, on, on, on halides. And, and from that, 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 for example, with the Mycenaean salinity crisis, they're trying to uh, infer uh, from the lipids. This is um, a group in Hamburg and um, they're trying to infer um, uh, the deposition of the environment um, of, um, of, of the carbonates and, and the gypsum, was it super salty or not, for example? I see. Thanks. Um, a question from Olga in the chat here. Uh, any nano halos in crystals? <laughs> Thanks, Olga. Um, so, yeah, so, so just for, for, for context, um, nano halos, so nano halo archaeota, um, belong to the Deepan superphylum uh, of the Archaea. That is the, 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 the super small um, uh, halo Archaea that, that generally live in conjunction with other organisms as um, has been shown by um, Olga uh, and Peter's group and, and, and their colleagues, uh, including certain uh, halo Archaea. Um, nothing, Never seen them, never detected them, or certainly no, never grown them, as you might expect, because they're very difficult to grow, uh, from uh, ancient salt. Um, we saw them in the four-year-old salt, so you know, marine salt that we eat, so we'll be eating them, consuming them, uh, along with the, the, the halo archaea. Um, but the numbers were, were relatively low compared to the numbers in the brine. And certainly from that very first study from the Japanese sultans, there was a reduction uh, in relative abundance of uh, the nano halo archaea, specifically nano selena, um, uh, from time zero from the brine through to 21 weeks of entombment in halite. It was one of the few groups uh, that did uh, decrease. It may, I, I, I don't know why. It, it, it could be some, uh, a whole host of reasons. It could be associated with its potential, the, the potential host. It could be uh, a change in, in the redox. Um, who knows? Who knows? I'd, I'd like to talk to you about that. All right, fair enough. Maybe you guys could talk about that offline if you like, and we'll just, I'm conscious of we're hitting the hour, so I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. And Terry's been kind enough to, to uh, entertain a, a, a good bit battery of questions from us and, and give us a great talk today. We really appreciate uh, you coming out to give us our last talk of the season, Terry. And uh, hopefully next year we'll be able to uh, present another good uh, uh, plate of talks, even if we might actually be able to get some face-to-face -face seminars and meetings going, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, I just want to thank everyone uh, for coming out for the last talk of the year for us and um, enjoy your summer off. Um, Karen, Kevin, would you guys like to add anything? Uh, no, no, that's great. Uh, thanks, everyone, obviously, for making this what it was. <laughs> it's been good.
So you'll, you'll hear from us again um, at the end of the summer with next year's program. And we'd invite your feedback and suggestions, ideas um, during the summer for next year's program, uh, what, what you liked, what you didn't like, feel free to contact us by email. But also there's a survey that we'd like to just get some basic feedback from you. And we try to keep it very short, just five questions. I posted the link again in the chat. So if you guys um, could have uh, take, take a moment to, to do the survey, uh, that would be really appreciated. Thanks very much. So thanks again to our speaker for today. Thanks, Terry.